Hey guys, Taki here. This is the Edge 2 Pro, and it's one of the smallest and most powerful SBCs on the market today. In this first look video, we're gonna delve into the current state of Linux and Android software on this, and I think you're gonna be impressed with what this board can do when it comes to emulation. Let's start with a quick unboxing. This is one of the smaller SBCs that I've tested so far on this channel, and it's kind of crazy to see how much they were able to pack into this form factor. Inside of the box, we have a quick start guide, a set of antenna cables, and the board itself. The bottom of the box has a rather thick and dense padded foam to keep this board safe during shipment. I don't know if all of the shipments will work like this, but my board came inside a slightly bigger box, which included a fan mounted to a metal heatsink, some screws, and a thin thermal pad. This processor has a very high performance ceiling, so we will need to use this fan to keep the temps at a manageable level. This fan is also a lot smaller than the fans used in other RK3588 boards that I've tested, so I'm interested to see if it will be able to hold up to the test that I've already done. It's always interesting to see some of the subtle differences between the companies that are making these kinds of products, and so far, I'm very impressed with the presentation of the Edge 2. This is the first product that I've ever used from this company, but I have used a lot of products from their competitors. One thing that I like that they're doing, for example, is they have quick access to the schematics, data sheets, and CAD files printed right on the Quick Start Guide. Other companies also provide some of these things, but they are usually tucked away online and require you to go scouting for them. As with any product of this size, the layout and the included features are going to be very important. I think it would be fair to classify this as a credit card SBC, and it manages to keep the total footprint down with some component mounting choices and a slight reduction in I.O. Starting from the top, we have a single USB 3.0 port that can output 1.5 amps and a 3.1 USB Type-C port that can also function as a display port, a full-size HDMI port, a second USB Type-C port for power delivery only, and a USB port that can output 1.3 amps. On either end of the Type-C ports, we have RGB lights that change depending on what you're doing with the board. Going around the board clockwise from the top, we have a tiny RTC battery, three physical turtle switches for reset, function, and power, a microphone, three camera connectors, a second microphone, an accelerometer, and our Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module. Based on my test, this seems to have full support in Android and in Linux. I'll also point out that my board came with RAM and EMC modules from Samsung. There's not a lot going on on the bottom of the board, but we do have the ability to add two screens to this and two additional I.O. boards if we wanted. Now let's talk about the specs of this board because they are the most important thing in this product when it comes to emulation and using this as a general PC. On the Edge 2 Pro, we have an RK3588S SoC. This comes in a 422 configuration with four Cortex A55 cores clocked at 1.5 gigahertz, two Cortex A76 cores clocked at 2.25 gigahertz, and two Cortex A76 cores clocked at 2.3 gigahertz. Not exactly sure why they went with this layout instead of a 4-4 configuration, but if you have any idea, let me know down below. Our GPU is a mid-range part, but it is from the latest batch of GPUs from Mali. This is a 4-core GPU with a max clock of 1 GHz. It's less important for my use case, but this also comes with an MPU that is rated for 6 tops. This Pro version comes with 16 GB of LPDDR4X RAM and 64 GB of eMMC. Out of the box, this board comes without any software, but it can run Ubuntu 2204 and Android 12 once you connect it to the internet. More on that in just a bit. I want to show you a comparison with a slightly similar SBC that I've already tested with this processor. This is the Core 3588J from Firefly that I did a video on a few months ago, and it's about the same size as the Edge 2. The main difference between these two boards is that the Firefly one uses a slightly better version of the RK3588 processor, and that it uses a larger carrier board to function, while the Edge 2 does not. So far, this will be the smallest total package that I've ever tested with this new RK processor. So let's get started with assembling this device because I cannot wait to test it out. I'll start by applying the thermal pad to the top of the SOC. This isn't the best for heat transfer, but it should be good enough for these tests. Then I will screw in the heatsink itself and connect the fan. This processor can technically be passively cooled, but we would probably need a third party case if we wanted to go with that route. Emulation would probably suffer as a result. The final thing to do is connect our antenna cables because we will need to use them in just a moment. Now this board does not come with a power adapter, so we will need to supply our own. Unlike lower-end SBCs, the 3588S consumes a lot of power. 
Thankfully, Ugreen decided to sponsor this showcase by sending over their Nexode Mini 45 watt charger. I've bought many products from this company that I use to make these videos, but I've never had a chance to use any of their chargers. This is a GAN charger, so it's a bit smaller than some of the other 45 watt chargers that I own, and it takes up less space on my power strip. The cool thing that this can do is supply power out of both outlets at the same time. Our Edge 2 uses upwards of 25 watts, so we would still have enough power left over to also charge a phone or other device while using this. This thing is on sale for $30 on Amazon, and I'll put a link down below if you want to learn more. The only thing left to do now is to plug this in and get started. This board comes with an empty eMMC module, which is not standard practice in this market. The Edge 2 is supposed to have a coprocessor that helps to flash the internal storage with firmware that you download onto the device. The name for this system is a bit weird, but I have to say that this was the smoothest process that I've ever gone through to get one of these guys up and running. No need for a PC, SD card, or proprietary software. Simply connect the board to the internet with the included menus, and you're off. I wanted to start this review by going over the Ubuntu build that they have for this, so that's the one that I went with. Once the download is finished, the installer will handle burning the software to your internal storage. More companies should go this route because it is very user-friendly. After a reboot, I am greeted with a semi-stock Ubuntu image. I'm going to set this up with some software off camera, and I'll come back after I've got everything that I want squared away. This is about a day after I filmed that last section, and I want to say that I did not expect to spend as much time on the Linux side of this SBC. I thought I would come in here, show some web browsing, maybe some video decoding, talk about how the GPU performance wasn't that good, and then quickly switch over to Android for emulation tests. That is not how things went. While there is still some work to be done to this system, I am very impressed with how this thing holds up as a PC and as an emulation device on the Linux side. So very quickly on a high level, sometimes these SBCs come without hardware accelerated graphics, opting instead to render things out using the CPU while people try to reverse engineer an open source driver. We have a fairly powerful CPU on this board. In fact, it is one of the most powerful open source processors available right now, but software rendering is very slow compared to being able to use the GPU. Thankfully on this board, we do have GPU drivers that we can use for hardware acceleration, but not every application is able to use them. In situations where it is not possible, you default back to something called LLVM pipe for OpenGL apps. To help you understand why this section took so long to film, and why I like the Linux side of this so much, I have two examples to show you the difference between LLVM pipe and apps that support the hardware GPU drivers. Our first test is GLMark2, and as you can see, the vendor is listed as Mesa, and the renderer is listed as LLVM pipe. This is software rendering. We still have FPS well over 100 for some of these tests, but we are using a lot of our CPU resources to do this. If you can imagine a situation like emulation, where you need CPU and GPU, you can kind of understand how this system would fail to perform well. After everything is said and done, we got a score of 156 after running this benchmark. Now let's launch the Wayland version of this test that does support our GPU with OpenGLS 3.2. Now our FPS for each of these tests is well over 1000 and our CPU utilization is much lower. For these tests, we're using less than a quarter of our total resources and now our score is 4022. Our second test is SuperTux Cart. Starting out first with the Wayland version, we are able to get 100 FPS. We also have very low CPU utilization. Using the software rendering version, the FPS drops down to five. When it comes to using this for web browsing and basic CPU tasks, I think you'll find that it has enough horsepower to hold up as a PC. In the two days that I've been testing this, I try to do as much as possible on the device itself, and that even includes compiling software that I'll show in the showcase. As long as you have a good internet connection, this thing will have no problem browsing the internet and streaming videos. This was advertised as being able to decode H.265 footage, so I wanted to check on that myself. The A76 cores are a bit taxed in this example, but they got the job done. I wanna now move over to emulation because there are a lot of things that I discovered, or I guess you could say uncovered, while messing around with this board. I went through and manually installed a bunch of RA cores, and I wanna start this section off with a few of the systems that I tested. On the lowest end that I tested, we have SNES, which is running very well. Just a bit up from here, we have GBA. Nintendo DS was originally only running at 30 FPS, but it jumped up to 60 when I went to record this part of the video a day later. As you can see, it is also running well. 
I initially was not getting good performance when it comes to N64 on this board under Linux, but I switched some settings around and I was able to get decent performance with the games that I picked and the rendering resolution that I used. When I went to test PS1, I was seeing some of the sluggish performance that I saw when I originally reviewed this processor a few months back. As you can see, our CPU is really struggling, and we only have this game running at 2x native without PGXP turned on. It turns out that this is using software rendering, but it is possible to get a Wayland version going. With the help of Stenzek, I compiled DuckStation from Source on my Edge 2, and the difference is night and day. Now we are able to run these games at 5x native, and I actually think we might be able to turn on PGXP without any issues since our CPU usage is so low. It seems like these games are running on the A55 cores, so we might be able to get even more performance by switching the affinity over to the A76 ones. So far so good, but obviously not every emulator is going to work that well. Dolphin is a big outlier given that it does not have any Wayland support right now. There was an effort a few years back to add Wayland support to Dolphin, but that seems to have died with only some one-off patches made by people that are in the same situation as me. As you can probably guess, GameCube games are way out of reach when we are forced to resort to software rendering. It's a big shame because this board would chew through GameCube and Wii games under Linux if it could. The company supplied an SDL version of this emulator in their reviewer guide that does not seem to be using software rendering. I set God of War to 2x and thought we probably had enough power to go to 3x, but the audio gets choppy, so I went back down to 2x for this system. I also tried to use the standalone version of Flycast, but it almost killed my board. For whatever reason, the RA core does not seem to have any issues, as you can see with Sonic Adventure 2. The standalone version can't even run the BIOS at over 1 FPS with 100% CPU utilization, so I'm not sure what's going on with that. The last emulator is probably the most impressive, because it just worked. The developer behind this app started to release ARM Linux builds of EtherSX2, and they not only support Wayland, they are very easy to use. I will need to test some of these games under Android because I think that a few of these ran better than they would have under Android, and that is amazing. The Linux software for the RK3588 is getting to the point where I wouldn't even need to use Android. Once the few emulators that don't have Wayland support end up getting Wayland support, this will be my de facto OS for the Edge 2. I like the Linux system on this so much that I don't want to flash over it. I spent a lot of time on this and I have everything where I want it to be, but I also want to test out Android and that means the eMMC needs to be wiped. I asked the company if I could borrow another unit just for the purpose of testing Android and they agreed. This time around, I used a wired internet connection to do the Android 12 download and I'm glad I did. I went ahead and flashed Android 12, but they did have an Android 12 image that stated it was Android 11. I didn't want to bother with that one. On the first boot, I have to say that I'm both surprised and impressed that this comes with Google Play on day one firmware. That is not commonplace in this market. Several other companies only manage to get GApp versions out a few weeks after their board ship, so this is a nice change of pace. The system itself is pretty stock, with only a few changes done for things like LED light controls and fan settings. The fan one is a big deal because there are no fan controls on other RK3588 boards that I've used. The only potential issue that I'm seeing is that this is a user debug build, which will mean we won't get the maximum amount of performance out of this board as we could. I'll still need to test to find out. But yeah, that's going to be it for this first look at the Edge 2 Pro. I've tested a lot of boards for this channel and on my own, and this one is one of the better ones. I had a lot of fun messing around on Linux, and that is not something that I thought I would be saying. My next video is going to be on Android, and if you have any things that you'd like me to include in that, you can leave those suggestions down below. If you enjoyed this showcase, Please show your support by leaving a like or subscribing to the channel. Happy gaming, everyone. Talk you out.